players uh, at the moment for injury replacement. How, uh, far, how far is Gallus off, uh, Tony, could you tell me? Uh, he, he should be fully uh, fully fit for the game in Perth on the 10th, but we'll, we'll, he should be able to get a run against Newcastle on the 4th. Great. Sergi, it's not all bad, as, as Andy said earlier. Kenny Lowe, we've been supporting this man for at least three to four months on this radio show. 32 players in the A-League or overseas Players like Birigetti, Riston, Sainsbury, El Babal, Macaroonas, Galloway, you name it, the list goes on. Yeah. I hope you, because I'm a big supporter of Australian clubs developing players, A, because we need to develop for the good of the national team, etc., etc., but, but B, because it has to form part of your budget of income, in other words, selling players overseas. Absolutely. Are you still going to stick to that plan? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, again, there have been... We all thought uh, uh, Alistair was the same and the thing, but, you know, it, it's difficult. Um, the biggest skill that you've got to have is man management skills in this job. And uh, Sir Alex Ferguson said that. Well, everyone knows that. But uh, just uh, in, in what I've seen uh, over you know, the last four years being involved in football in WA, he's got those skills. And you know, it's just unfortunate he was a very smart engineer and he couldn't afford uh, at the time to do a full-time role. Now he can, and uh, I, I, I hope he can... Uh, to everyone in Australia as well after, after the first story that he's the man for the job going forward for, for years to come. Tony, let me but, say but, something. But, but, one thing I do want to sell on your radio station um, is, is the fact that I mean, not only David the Vox Monday, but uh, Bev Murray said it, you know, we're a basket case with this. I mean, we've made the final three out of four years. Our memberships are up uh, 20%, which is the third in the league. Uh, our crowds are up 10%, but we're not a basket case. So, I mean, I've, I've taken it from a $3 million loss when the FFA had it back in 2007 to uh, you know, we would have broken even if I didn't decide, uh, or if um, Alistair didn't decide to bring William Garrett out. So it's a small loss this year, but, you know, we're certainly not a basket case. And, you know, seven coaches in nine years, but four and a part of those were anything to do with Tony Tate. <laughs> let, let, Sage, let me say this to you. The, the, the basket case comment um, comes from from people that are mates with Alistair. There's no secret that Craig Foster, a, a good professional football pundit, um, but a very close confidant of Mr Edwards, was, and his organisation came out. I've texted Les Murray today to say that he got it all wrong, he was out of line. I said, we got Dave Davidovich on the show later, and I want to challenge Dave to tell me, who's a friend of mine, why he considers it a basket case, and does he know the, the whole picture? Because the reality is it's easy for people to, to get their mates to write something when they don't have the facts. It's blind faith, it's called loyalty, and there's an element of goodness in that, but the reality is some very senior journalists, respected journalists, got it completely wrong, and they're backtracking today. Um, and for what it's worth, you don't need Perth glory. You, you travel the world, your businesses are overseas, most of them, a lot of them. You do this because you love football. You come to meetings, and I know this for a fact, with the FFA, for games, because you love football. At the end of the day, if they want to discourage people that love football, I want to see the colour of their money in running football clubs. Yeah, well, that's, uh, it's, it's all true. I've, I've been away this year 160 days, so I don't have a lot to do with the day-to-day -day running of the club. Everyone thinks I eat a beer uh, and, and get involved in these decisions. I don't. I, I don't at all. And the, the, the managers that have been working for me can tell you that. But And the reason that I do... Uh, nine games in a row, even though he took us to a grand final. Uh, I didn't listen to the players or anything like that. It was a decision. But it was a great decision because Alistair came in and got us the, uh, uh, one uh, bad penalty kick away from the preliminary final last year. So, um, you know, it, it, it's not a bad club. It's a successful club. It will be more successful on the pitch. Uh, it's just, I mean, some clubs would love to be in the final three out of four years. There's four or five clubs that haven't had that record. So, you know, I'm proud of what we've done here at Perth Glory. Yeah, I just don't like uh, some sections of the media having a go when they don't know what's going on inside the club. Especially when you're so accessible. On that note, mate, I just want to thank you. We wish you all the best. I'm, I'm, I'm fairly confident that the bloke that's taken over is going to make that club proud and, and, and hopefully help um, develop some more players, only this time for the benefit of Perth Glory Football Club. Okay, thanks very much, guys. I appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Barry. Thank you, mate. Cheers. Bye -bye. Cheers. Perth Glory Football Club, and he was quite... Um, quite direct in, in some of his uh, assessments of what went on with, with Alistair Edwards. I know with interest last week you wrote a story and and 
there was a sort of assumptions that maybe Perth is not running itself as, as a fine tuned up uh, football club as it should. Sage obviously made reference to some of those comments from you amongst others, um, claiming that um, he, he spent last year 160 days overseas. He had no partake, uh, partake in any of the contract negotiations, only to find out that some of the contracts that were given to Cameron and Ryan Edwards were, were um, completely different to the rest of the squad. To some of the, it was demanded by his six senior co- uh, players that he come to a meeting because they'd had enough with what was going on at training and some of the bullying and, and demeanour f- factors. We find today that um, that Edwards has made some other comments that are incorrect and that forced his hand to to not sack him, but to try and find a compromise which Edwards blatantly refused. Yeah, I mean, I didn't hear what Tony Slade said, but uh, you know, obviously expecting to defend his club. But uh, I mean, look, I, I come from the position of uh, I lived in Perth for two years and covered the Perth Glory, and um, it was the first two years of the A League, and saw a very similar situation unfold with Steve McMahon, who signed his son, who was arguably the worst. Yeah, I'd say arguably the worst player to have ever um, played in the A League because there's been some absolute shockers, but. Uh, that was a clear case of nepotism, absolutely no doubt about it. Now, this nepotism issue has, has reared its head here, but the issue for me is that, uh, as I said, we, we've seen glory just stutter through the first seven or eight years of the A-League with no clear direction. In the meantime, we've seen, I had a list on Fox Sports on Friday night about, we had 14 players, young players have either gone into state or overseas, um, to, to pursue their careers because they knew they weren't going to get a chance at their hometown club. Now, pound for pound, in my opinion, Perth are producing, WA is producing the young players mm. in Australia at the moment. WA a lot has to do with the Perth. bloke that's just taken over at Perth too. Sorry? Oh. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, Kenny Lowe has, has a massive part to play in that. And, and I'll, I'll get to him in a second. But uh, I think, um, you know, a bit of context has been lost here and... and WA Perth people are so parochial, they want to see their own in there. So I really felt that in the last sort of six to nine months, with Edwards in charge, the club finally started going in the right direction. And we've seen the crowds gradually pick up and, you know, a real groundswell of support and positivity down there. And as soon as, I mean, there's these stories, I guess, coming out, but as soon as there was a bit of, uh, you know, angst in the background, then, uh, you know, the, the, the the guy was fired. Now, Edwards absolutely has flaws as a coach. Um, and, and, you know, he's, he's done a few, you know, things allegedly, which, uh, again, I, I didn't hear everything that Tony Sage said. But for me, these are all issues that could have been and should have been resolved in meetings with, with a solid um, run club, solid run well, they, and, well, and, and I'll interrupt you there, David. I'll interrupt you. They were. Yeah. He was given a clear un, um, ultimatum. Don't talk to the media. Get back here. Let's have a discussion. So he, he, he went across against what the CEO's instructions were to what happened in Melbourne. The players were told not to talk to the media. He was told not to talk to the media. He decided to, to, to make it seem like it was a Jacob Burns and, and Ellis Edwards war. It wasn't. Further investigations proved, and I, I've got five players that I manage up there in another uh, field that I'm involved in. I was told categorically there would be no bonuses, there's no incentives for overseas transfers, none of that. All these things are in the Cameron and Ryan Edwards contracts, number one. Number two, Navin, who's one of his lawless assistants, would often talk about alternative players and alternative things in the presence of players on the bench, and he would always overrule them in favour of Cameron Edwards in particular. This is the same Cameron Edwards that wasn't good enough to make Melbourne Hart. Yeah, and and look, these these are all opinions, Tony, because no, they're Cameron facts. Edwards, well, Cameron Edwards, I've uh, spoken to Melbourne Hart about Cameron Edwards, and I'm told by their football department that he he's good enough to be an A-League player. They're disappointed he didn't get a run. If you have a look at Melbourne Hart, they don't play young players anymore. So, again, it's, uh, it's, it comes down to opportunity. If he was a Melbourne player, uh, Melbourne boy, they said they reckon they would have kept him on, on their list. So, again, Black... You know, well, I spoke to the same people that you talked to, and they told me something a little bit different last week. Okay, well, they've lied to someone. So well, that, absolutely. I know, you know, that's the beauty about the, our beautiful game. You can get away with it. Yeah, but, you know, again, we're talking about, you know, if we talk about bonuses and that sort of stuff, I mean, Ryan and Cameron Edwards are on 
pretty close to minimum wage. No, they're um, not. They're on 70000 and 90000 respectively, Cameron and Ryan, with bonuses that no other player in their club has got. That's a fact. They've, oh, also, they've also got, in Ryan's case, accommodation provided. So it's, they're not on... Let me tell you, there's about 12 players in that squad that are on less than them. Okay. Well, my info is that they're on a little bit less than that. Um, not much, but a little bit. And, you know, again, if we're... To, again, I think that we've, we've lost complete context here because if you compare that to some of the fat cat contracts that have been handed out over the last four or five years... No doubt about uh, that. ...with absolute lavish, crazy spending by, uh, by Perth Glory, um, mm-hmm. I still think they've gone in the right direction. And again, we go back to this philosophy that, they, that they're pursuing, going back to this youth structure... Is it nepotism? Maybe, maybe not. But the Edwards boys are young WA boys. The 12 to 18 months ago, the Perth locals were were, were absolutely livid about that they weren't on the Perth Glory squad. So, yes, their father signed them, but they do fit into this young um, WA youth philosophy. No so doubt, but they don't demand debate, an automatic selection. They that till the, cow, till the cows come home. So, look, I think, uh, I, I think that Good things have been done. I mean, they're, what, five, six points ahead of a club like Melbourne Art who are sticking behind their coach. I think they needed to back Alistair Edwards in this situation, and that's just uh, that's just my opinion. As always, I love having these debates with you. <laughs> they're, they're interesting. I love talking to real football people. Thanks for joining us, and we hope to get you on the show soon. Again. Good on you, boys. Thanks, Thanks Dave. Cheers, Dave. Cheers, Dave.